morning, uh, morning than uh, everyone. It's, uh, it's warm today, isn't it? There was a little bit on the on the warm side. It's uh, oh, it's it's lovely though, isn't it? Nice to see the sun and see the warm weather. And uh, yeah, we we had our um, uh, we got a new picnic bench um, the other um, a, a week or two ago because it was sort of a belated birthday present for me from last year. Um, so my mother-in-law gave us a picnic bench, and so we had we had lunch outside yesterday. Which is, um, you know, we haven't had many chances to use it so far, so that was rather nice. Um, at lunch and dinner, in fact, actually. So there we go. That was, that was how warm it was yesterday. Does anyone have any nice news for us today, Dory? It's, it's nice to see you, though. <laughs> That's the news, isn't it? It's lovely to see you back. I'm getting better. I'm getting better. And it's good to see you, Margaret, too, as well. It was lovely, didn't it? Yeah, that's right. And um, yeah, so well, it's lovely to see all of you on this lovely day. And uh, so let's let's start then our, our time together uh, as we uh, as we do with a psalm. And uh, we'll use Psalm 117, Psalm 117, which is page 616, page 616 of the Church Bible, Psalm 117. And this is only a very, very short psalm. In fact, I think this is possibly the shortest psalm in the Bible. Just two verses. Uh, psalm 117, page 616. But uh, it's only short, but why don't we say these words all together? Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. I was thinking about that this morning, and I was just thinking how, I know it's only short, you know, it's only simple, but actually it's something which is really important, isn't it? Praise the Lord. Because his love is great towards us and his faithfulness endures forever. And that's something which, um, something we don't have to use big and complicated words, lots of words to praise God. We can just use a few words. Because actually it's not about how many words we use, but actually how, how great his love is and how great his faithfulness is. So uh, let's do that as we come to our first hymn. Number 645. All creatures of our God and King. It's number 645. What are we standing in?
to take up our service sheets as we say together the prayer of preparation, asking God to, uh, to prepare our hearts and to cleanse us uh, by the Holy Spirit. And so we pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and will be magnified your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. I was thinking a little bit this week about why, um, well, just thinking about sin and about how so often I think the Bible puts it differently to the way that we would. Because we so often would think about sin as just being things that we do to other people and uh, the things that we would do wrong. And that's how we just instinctively think about it, isn't it? But we don't think so much about sin being something which is... Uh, to do with God and to do with how we are with him and, and particularly how we don't praise him for his love and for his faithfulness in the way that we should. And um, I think it's, it's, I think it strikes home a bit more when you think about it like that, uh, isn't it? You know, that we actually, we need Psalms like Psalm 117 to tell us to praise the Lord for his love and for his enduring faithfulness. Because the truth is, if we're honest, that we don't praise him like that as we should. Um, day by day. And that's why in the, the summary of the law, uh, Jesus said the first commandment is to hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's the first greatest commandment, to love the Lord our God. The second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. A prayer for the Queen and for the government. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, bless our sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth, and all who are in authority under her, that they may order all things in wisdom and equity, righteousness and peace, to the honour and glory of your name, and the good of your church and people, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 We're going to have our, our scripture reading now, and uh, Anne's going to come and bring us the reading. It's uh, from Revelation chapters 8 and 9, at the end of the Bible. So thanks very much, Anne, for... Bring us over to the Hello. The first reading today is um, Revelations chapter 8, verses 1 to um, 5. And then there's more after that. <laughs> the seventh seal and the golden censer. When he opened the seventh seal, oh, did I say where it was? It's some um, revolution, Revelations chapter 8, um, verses 1 to, to 5, page 1239. Sorry about that. The seventh seal and the golden censer. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on, on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. And we now have in chapter 9, verses 1 to 21, 
by each one, two, three, nine. The fifth angel surround, sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The, the star was given the keys to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss, and out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months, and the agony they suffered was like that of a sting of a scorpion when it strikes. During those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. The locusts look like horses prepared for battle. On their heads, they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails with stings, like scorpions, and in their tails they had power to torment people for five months. They had a king over them, the angel of the abbas, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is a polygon, that is destroyer. The first woe is past, two other woes are yet to come. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God. He said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river of Rates, and the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000, I heard their number. The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue and yellow as sulphur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke and sulphur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke and sulphur that came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in, their, was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails were like snakes, having heads with which they inflict injury. The rest of mankind who was not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshipping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, do uh, keep, a, keep a finger in that passage. Thanks, Anne, for reading that. It was a slightly longer reading there. Um, but it's all part of the same section. Um, do keep a finger in that. Um, we'll say together the creed before we come to look at that passage. So if you just turn back to your service sheets for a moment, and we'll say the Nicene Creed together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that he is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory 
to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Do turn back in your Bibles then to Revelation chapter 8, page 1239, if you'd like to follow along in the church Bibles. So we're thinking today about what, what the meaning is of all of the, the chaos and all of the suffering and all of the, the tumult that's going on in the world. And it seems like we've had a lot of that recently over the last few years. I mean, there always is. Um, there always are things going on in the world and you always um, you know, turn on the news and you'll see there's a war in one part of the world or another. Or, but it feels like the last couple of years particularly, um, there's been a lot of that kind of thing happening. And, a lot of people have been asking questions and asking, well, what, what's the meaning of all of this? Does it have some kind of purpose? And I think this is where Revelation helps to peel back the meaning of human history. Because this is, um, as I'm sure that you will have gathered as we were going through, there's a lot of, it's a lot of a kind of visionary, you know, there's a, uh, all the, the locusts and things like that. It's all the, you know, what's the meaning of these visions? But actually... The message here of these chapters is helping us to understand what's happening throughout human history. That's the point of the book of Revelation. Now, do you remember um, a week or two ago we looked at the, the seven seals? And um, we didn't actually get to the seventh seal. There were six. And then here, at the beginning of chapter 8, it says the seventh seal is opened and there's silence in heaven for about half an hour. And then we find that the seventh seal is actually the seven trumpets. And that's how Revelation goes. It's sort of the one thing leads into another thing. And so that's why we didn't have a seventh seal. It's, it's sort of like saying the end is not the end just yet. You know, there's more to come. And so it's just giving us a different perspective. And that's what I think this, these two chapters are, the trumpets. It's looking at things now, it's not another set of events. It's looking at the same events, but this time from a different perspective. It's looking at it actually from the perspective of from those who do not know God. That's the, the perspective, from the perspective of the unbelieving world, rather than the church, which is what the, the seals, I think, were about. So this is looking at the world. Um, but we do have that lovely picture again. Uh, do you remember we saw this before? An angel had a golden uh, censer and he was given incense with the prayers of all God's people and uh, it rising up to God. And I just thought, again, what a beautiful image again. You know, the prayers of God's people being offered to him as incense. Uh, you know, what an, an encouragement it is in our prayers if you think about our prayers going to God as incense to him as a, a fragrance offering. You know, it's a, a, a real encouragement, isn't it? Uh, so, um, so then what happens with the trumpets? They've been given seven trumpets, and you know, we won't go through every single, every single one. But we have the same pattern again in Revelation. We've sort of got four that come together, and then there's two, and then the seventh one is you know, sort of deferred, if you like. So what happens in the first four trumpets? Uh, well, it, it talks about um, the uh, third of the earth has burned up, the trees burned up, um, there were, it's the sea, um, a third of the ships were destroyed and a third of the living creatures in the sea died. Then there's the, the water, um, a third of the waters turned bitter. And then the fourth one, it was the sun and uh, it, darkness comes over. Now, what does that 
remind you of if you think about things in other things, perhaps in the Old Testament? I think the thing that comes to mind is the plagues, isn't it? The ten plagues from the book of uh, Exodus of Pharaoh in Egypt. Because then also the, the Nile turned to blood, there was darkness and, um, and so on. So it was very similar, isn't it, to what happened then. And in the case of the ten plagues in Egypt, it was God's judgment upon, upon the land of Egypt for not letting the people go. As Moses said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, no, I will not let your people go. And so there were the ten plagues. So it was very similar, a very similar thing going on in this passage. And um, you think it's so relevant to what's happening in the world today, isn't it? So just to take one example, you know, how it says the third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees and, and the green grass. You think about, uh, was it a year or two ago when there were all those wildfires in Australia? And it was massive, wasn't it? All of those wildfires. And across, and I think California as well has had it. This kind of thing happens all the time. But again, it's, it's explaining uh, why these kind of natural disasters happen, which is not the judgment for specific things, but it is nonetheless God's judgment upon sin. And it is throughout, you have this repetition of the third. What's going on there? Why does he keep saying a third of this, a third of that? It just means that it's, it's limited. It's not total destruction. That's the point of it. It's a limited thing. But it's a picture of the final judgment. It's to say it may be limited now, but in the future it will be complete. And that's, uh, that should give us a clue as to what, what this passage is all about. But we'll come on to that in just a moment. So the fifth and sixth trumpets... Um, these are when it, it, it turns then to, to dealing with human beings, when it turns to mankind. So whereas the first four have been about the earth and about, you know, sort of the natural world, if you like, trumpets five and six are about human beings. So trumpet five is about um, pain and, and suffering. And as it says, uh, during those days people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. So it's not, actually, it's not actually death, but it's about suffering. And that is, it could be anything. I mean, it's very visual language, isn't it? But I think it could be talking about all kinds of suffering that people go through. And, um, and yet it does say, verse 4, they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. It's interesting, isn't it? That doesn't mean that people who belong to God uh, do not go through any kinds of suffering. But uh, there is a, it, belonging to God does transform our suffering, doesn't it? It means that everything works out for good, for the good of those who love the Lord, even, even, uh, even suffering. And it's all under the control of, um, of Satan. So it says, verse 11, They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is Apollyon, that is, destroyer. So it doesn't name him here. In fact, Satan isn't named often in the, in the Bible. But I think that, that surely the only, the only one who that could be, isn't it? You know, thinking about the, the, uh, uh, the king of the abyss, the angel of the abyss. And I think it just goes to show the, you know, the mystery of God's, sovereign control over these things because now we saw this all last time as well how uh, John doesn't say you know God said this God says that sort of it says there's a voice that came from the throne or there's you know there are all sorts of things but it, it it's a mystery isn't it how God is sovereign over everything even over evil and yet how God never does anything never God never causes evil and one helpful picture I, um, I heard about this was um, like a candle and a shadow. Now, is the candle responsible for creating the shadow? And of course, it's, it's like that with God. You know, is God responsible for creating evil? You know, God is light. There's no darkness in him. Um, so I thought that was quite a helpful, helpful way of thinking about it. 
So then the final trumpet is actually death. And um, this is what it says, verse 15. The four angels who have been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. So death is the, uh, is the final trumpet. It's a bit like the, um, again, you know, we think about the seven, the um, ten plagues, but it gets progressively worse, doesn't it? You know, it starts out with fairly uh, innocuous things and then it finishes off with the death of the firstborn. That's the final of the ten plagues. So it's, it sort of gets progressively more uh, dangerous, if you like, to, to us, to, to human beings. So what's the point of all of this? And I'm sure that's what you're thinking. Thinking, well, all of this is happening, and I can see how this is happening in, in the world. You know, I can see how there's a lot of suffering, death. I can see how there are natural disasters, all of those things. But why? And that's where it, it comes up. Verses 20 and 21, this is the point. This is what all of this has been leading up to. Where it says this, The rest of mankind, who were not killed by these plagues, still did not repent of the work of their hands. They didn't stop worshipping demons and idols, um, nor did they repent of their, their immorality. They still did not repent. Now that is the, the meaning of all of these things that have been happening. The trumpets, what do you use a trumpet for? It's a, a wake-up call, isn't it? In the army, I believe, they have that at the, the start of the day, isn't it? You know, the, I, can't, I can't remember what it is, but you know, they have the, you know, the, the wake, wake you up at the start of the day. That's what you have, isn't it? And I tell you, if you had a trumpet next to you, you, know, you would pretty soon wake up. And that's the message of all of these things that have been happening. It's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call for, for human beings to listen and an opportunity to turn to God. And yet, as it says in Revelation, they still did not repent. And that is the, that is the sinfulness of humanity. That even despite all of these things happening, then uh, men still did not turn to the living God. So what should we conclude about all of these things? What can we conclude from the chapter? It's that all of the, the chaos in the world, the suffering in the world, all of these things, these are, should be warnings. They should be warnings. They are designed to be a, you know, if you um, walk along the beach sometimes, you'll see a, a sign saying, please no swimming at this point because it's too dangerous. And it's that kind of, it's that kind of thing. It's a warning saying, this is, this is dangerous territory and you need to look for safety. That's why these things are happening. So this is exactly what Jesus said. And in fact, I think we looked at this passage just before uh, Christmas in, the, uh, in our Advent series. But Luke chapter 13, verses 1 to 5, this is what Jesus said. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. That's what Jesus said, that these terrible things that happen are about. It's a message, and the message is, unless you repent, you will all perish, in Jesus' words. It's a message saying that whatever is happening now is nothing compared to the final judgment. And it should be a wake-up call. It should be a way, it's a message to us as a wake-up call. Now why does God have to use such uh, strong methods to wake us up? Because unfortunately it takes that for us as human beings. This is what C.S. Lewis once said. 
pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Pain is God's megaphone, as C.S. Lewis said. And I think if we think about our own lives, I think that's true in our experience, isn't it? Now, when times are going well, then we tend not to think very much of God, do we? We tend not to pray as much. We tend not to give thanks to him as much and on all of these things. But as soon as pain comes in, then you start to pray. And, and that's... And that's the thing, that the question which I wanted to finish us, uh, to leave us with, which is, are we listening? Now, if, this is a, if these are trumpets meant to wake us up, then are we listening to what's happening? Now, are we listening to God in our own lives? Now, when we encounter pain, when we encounter suffering or, or adversity, whatever it may be, do we seek God and do we turn to Him? I often think there are there are really two ways that we can deal with suffering and we can deal with pain. We can either turn to God or we can turn away from him. And I can think of examples recently of people I know who've done both of those things. Some people turn to God, some people turn away from him. And I think what, what we are being, um, one of the messages here is that we need to turn to God in all of these times. So that's the first thing. Do we turn to God? Do we seek him in times of adversity and suffering? But the second thing is, are we helping others to listen? Are we helping others to hear that message? Because it's really the, the trumpet calls, as, as we've seen, it's a message for the world. The trumpet calls of all of the, the things going on, it's a message for out there. I mean, yes, we need to be listening too, but that they need to hear it. And that's the question, which is, are we helping them out there, if you like, to hear that message as well? You know, thinking about perhaps um, even friends, family, um, neighbours, work colleagues, those we know who are maybe asking questions about what's happening, and maybe thinking, well, why is this happening? And perhaps that's an opportunity for us to say, well, you know, we need to seek the Lord while he may be found. And this is actually what, what it says, while there is opportunity to turn to God, then that is what we should do. And we should be uh, living lives of witness, witnessing to the truth. And I'll just finish with these words. This is what Jesus says, Mark chapter 8 Verse 38, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And that's a, a challenge, I think, for us, isn't it? Just thinking that, you know, when we hear the trumpet calls of, of all of the things happening in the world, then we mustn't be ashamed to say this is a message which should bring us to repentance. This is a message which should bring us to God, and, uh, and we should be um, able to, to say that our own faith, speak how uh, we are living in the light of God, but also issue that challenge to others as well. And it's something that we need God's help for, something that we need to come to him and ask for his help for, because, I mean, look, um, I will finish with this, but this is, the other day I was reading, you know, what Paul said in um, Ephesians chapter 6. Pray for me that I may speak the word of God boldly as I should. I think, you know, if Paul, the great apostle, the one who was responsible for evangelising the Gentiles and starting goodness knows how many churches and all of that, if he could ask people to pray for boldness, then, you know, I think, goodness me, don't you and I need to pray for that? So why don't we, uh, why don't we close now and we'll pray and ask God for his help in... Uh, both listening to this message ourselves, but also helping other people uh, to hear that message too. And so, Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you that uh, you do um, care about us enough to give us warnings. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you would 
help us as individuals uh, to heed uh, that time. And when we encounter times of adversity or suffering or uh, tragedy, that we would turn to you. And we thank you, Lord, that you do uh, protect us through those times, knowing that you turn all things uh, for our good, uh, for those who love you, who are called according to your purpose. Uh, but we also pray, Lord, for the world um, out there uh, who do not heed you, who are not listening. And we pray, Lord, that, uh, that they would listen, that people would think about what is happening in the world and turn to you while there is still time. And uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us uh, to know how best to, uh, to, to help people uh, understand what that means. We pray that you would give us boldness. We pray that you would give us wisdom and, and all that we need, or the right words to say when, uh, when the time is right. So we pray all of these things, trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's, uh, let's continue in prayer today and um, uh, this afternoon I'm going into uh, to Camp Hall with Hannah and we're going to do, they've asked for um, a church service, sort of. Um, I think they're teaching about different, uh, different things. Uh, Hannah's been asked to just to, to show them what a church service is like. So uh, that's at half past one this, uh, this afternoon. So um, yes, let's pray for that. And pray for our schools as well while we're, while we're at it. Let's continue praying for obviously all of the terrible things going on, especially in Ukraine at the moment. And um, let's, uh, let's pray for, for those who need. <clears throat> so Heavenly Father, as we uh, turn to our prayers today, we, uh, we do give you thanks, Lord, for the way that you love us and keep us. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for, um, for your, uh, your protection and for your guiding hand upon us. And um, Lord, we can, I'm sure we can each think of times in our own lives where we've seen your hand at work. And we give you thanks, Lord, for, for the way that you do lead us. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would lead us forward as, as individuals and as a church, especially as we pray uh, for a great awakening as we pray for, for many people to hear and believe in your, your gospel message. And we pray especially today for the, the children and young people and thank you so much Lord that we do have opportunities uh, in this day, um, at this day and age Lord and, and today to go in to uh, local schools and to help children to understand what it means to follow Jesus. And I just want to pray today for, um, for Hannah and for myself as we go into Can Hall later on and uh, show them what a church service is like. And uh, pray, Lord, for all of the other times when we, we can have that opportunity to go into schools. And pray, Lord, that your message would really come through and that children would be struck by something that they hear, um, perhaps some of the songs or whatever it might be, Lord, that you would be at work um, in every area of our parish and in every age group, um, in every way, Lord. Uh, we pray now for the, the wider situation in the, uh, in the world and uh, we do continue to lift up the situation with the, the war in Ukraine and Lord, we do long for peace and long for an end to the bloodshed and for an end to this conflict. And uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would change hearts and pray that you would bring about um, peace in a, in a wonderful way, Lord, which only you can accomplish. Uh, we do pray especially for um, the, the churches and the uh, individuals who are seeking to bring aid to those who need it the most. And we pray, Lord, that you would grant them protection and wisdom as they go about this, knowing how, how to get the aid to the people who need it the most. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that um, you would grant our leaders in, in the Western world wisdom in how to engage and that um, you would just enable them to, to support uh, the people of Ukraine in just the right way and that um, very soon, Lord, this will be over. And so we do lift, the, lift up the people 
uh, all those who've been um, uh, bereaved, all those who have been injured, uh, all, the, all of them to you, Lord, and ask for, for your blessing in a way that we is beyond that ourselves, Lord. And we do pray uh, finally for those who are in particular need, um, either among us or those who those who we know and love. And uh, let's take a moment to pray, uh, either quietly or out loud, just about anyone who's on your heart today. Dear Father God, I do thank you that uh, you let your healing hand on my neighbours who was taken into hospital two days ago with pains in her chest. And uh, all the tests have been done and so far, Father God, in your name, nothing has been found that is dangerous to her. Just pray for her last test today that all will be well. And I do thank you, Lord, for your healing hand when it is your will to do so around the world. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we before you now, my name is Paul and Son, Lord. He's giving me back and thank you, Lord. Please, Lord. He's giving me back to work with you, Lord. Please, Lord, just talk to sort his mind out that he's ready, he's back before he signs on. Amen. Amen. And Lord, we do um, continue to pray for Cathy and uh, just pray, Lord, that you would uh, watch over her and uh, we pray that she would soon um, be able to return to us as well. As, um, we know that she misses us and, and we miss her. And we pray for your presence near to her at the moment as well. So we just pray for all of these people, Lord, and all of these things, trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's uh, sing again then. So it's number 429 in the hymn books. 429. <clears throat> it's, oh Lord, the clouds are gathering, which is uh, not true of the weather today, but uh, is true in the sort of the spiritual sense, isn't it? As, as we were looking at in Revelation, um, asking God to have mercy on us. But I love the last verse of this hymn. Yet, O Lord, your glorious cross shall tower triumphant in this land, evil confounding. And I think what a wonderful um, words to sing, especially as we come to the Lord's table. 429, let's stand and sing.
It's encouraging, isn't it, that the darkness does not triumph, but that actually we see at the cross that good triumphs over evil. Do please be seated. I think that's where it's uh, it's good. It's good as we uh, take communion that um, just remembering that that actually what what happens here is connected with the world events because actually that the cross is not just where uh, you know we have individual forgiveness. Although that is fundamental, but that actually it's where evil is defeated forever. And that's something we can look to at the cross. And we can look at all that's happening over the world and see actually we know that that's all defeated. And that will one day all be history. If you turn to your service sheets and uh, we'll join in with the confession. Uh, just read the introduction and then we'll join in with the confession. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we gather at the Lord's table, we must recall the promises and warnings given to us in the Scriptures. Let us therefore examine ourselves and repent of our sins. Let us give thanks to God for his redemption of the world through his Son, Jesus Christ. And as we remember Christ's death for us and receive this pledge of his love, let us resolve to serve him in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. You then, who truly and earnestly repent of your sins, and are in love and charity with your neighbours, and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God, and walking from this day forward in his holy ways, draw near with faith, and take this holy sacrament to your comfort, and make your humble confession to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we acknowledge and lament our many sins and the wickedness we have committed time after time by thought, word and deed against your divine majesty. We have provoked your righteous anger and your indignation against us. We earnestly repent and are deeply sorry for these our wrongdoings. The memory of them weighs us down. The burden of them is too great for us to bear. Have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that from this time forward we may always serve and please you in newness of life, to the honour and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. There's a, a lovely moment in the book. Pilgrim's Progress, where Christian, he uh, comes to Christ, but he, he, he uh, still feels the burden pulling him down on his shoulders. But then he realises, then he realises he comes to Christ and the burden falls off. We cannot bury, uh, carry our own burden ourselves, but it is on Christ at the cross, and we no longer bear it. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him. Have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Here in the words of, uh, our, of comfort, our Saviour Christ says to all who truly turn to him, Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Hear what St Paul says. This saying is true and worthy of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear what St John says. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous and he is the propitiation for our sins. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right, 
It is our duty and our joy, at all times and in all places, to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We pray together. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there, by his one oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. He instituted, and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue, a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that we, receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same light that he is betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. Amen. And let's pray together as the Lord Jesus taught us to pray. <coughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom, power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we'll pray on the, uh, the back page of our service sheet, the prayer after communion. Lord and Heavenly Father, we offer you, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant that by his merits and death, and through faith in his blood, we and all your church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and our bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice. Fill us all who share in this holy communion with your grace and heavenly blessing. Although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer you any sacrifice, yet we pray that you will accept this the duty and service that we owe. Do not weigh our merits above our offences, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, that's... Uh very nearly the end of our, our service this morning. Um, there's not much to say uh, notice-wise. I think it's um, 
all proceeding as the notice sheet, apart from the fact that we're having Wednesday worshippers today, which somehow made it um, disappear off the, the notice sheet. Um, but we will be back. We'll be back next week. Um, and um, uh, the services, I think it's just normal normal services this, uh, this coming weekend, isn't it? Anything, anything particular to mention? Flyers for the first Wednesday. Oh, so two weeks time, first Wednesday, the flyers are at the back. And also the, the um, if you want to do a reading um, or anything, then that's on the back table as well. Well, shall we um, sing together then a final hymn? It's number 192. 192. How lovely on the mountains. <coughs> One nine two. We'll finish singing that our God reigns. Uh, One nine two. Let's stand and sing together.